Okay, so my talk is entitled Low-Level iPhone Programming um, and more. So just go to the second slide when it's up. Right. So relative closeness. iPhone OS remains relatively closed despite being jailbroken. Very chosen few know about the architecture of low-level components like the kernel or iBoot. Like, for example, if you ask a jailbreak developer what is the kernel static mapping, they will probably have no idea. Even more chosen few actually choose to exploit it. This is why you probably don't see jailbreaks by like random people that actually, you know, target newer OS versions and everything. And of course, reverse engineering closed hardware designs is hard too. There's no documentation on anything like the Apple A4 or Apple A5. You have to make all the documentation yourself. Next slide. So the community definitely has a lot of interest in user level components like Quartz Core, Core Animation, Springboard, UI Kit, and everything. And of course, in the jailbreaking world, you see lots of cool tweaks like OXO, Aki, Message Box, and so on. But not a lot of people actually know a lot about the core OS that's underneath, like the technologies that lie in the XNU kernel, the technologies that lie in DYLD, LaunchD, XPC, and so on. Next slide. So the core OS that lies underneath both iPhone OS and OS X is known as Darwin. Um, Darwin was released about 14 years ago with the original release of Mac OS X, and people have sort of stopped caring about it after Mac OS X Leopard. One of my projects was to port the XNU kernel from the Darwin project, the ARM architecture, as to effectively provide an open source, found as to provide an open source foundation for an ARM port of Darwin. Now, since this is based on the same code as well, Mac OS X and iOS, it's able to run Mac OS X, well, iOS applications on an ARM device. For example, you might have seen one of my, like an OKN 900 running LaunchD and Bash and LaunchCTL and Syslog and other sorts of command line applications. Next slide. So some technical notes on like the differences between iOS 4 and iOS 5 and iOS 6, well, for my kernel in specific, um, the iOS 4 application binary interface specifies 32-bit integer types for things like mock VM address, uh, VM map address, and so on. iOS 5 switched over to 64-bit integer types. And this might have been a preliminary measure to get ready for the 64-bit architecture that you can see in the iPhone 5S. Now, there's some weird things that iOS 5 does with mock traps, like, for example, the VM allocate function, which allocates virtual memory mappings. There are two, there are three different versions. One uses the mock message API. One is called VM allocate and it's a kernel remote code procedure call trap. And the other is called mock VM allocate, which is also a kernel remote call procedure trap. Now there are, I have no idea why three versions of this exist, but in iOS 6, they got rid of the mock VM, they got rid of the VM allocate traps that they use in iOS 5 and switched over to mock VM allocate. I have no idea why they do these things, but that's just how Apple is. Also, they moved the com page address from 0x40 whatever to FFFF1000. Now, here's a fun little fact about the com page. You can actually use data in the com page to detect whether a device is jailbroken tethered or jailbroken untethered because there's a field in the com page that is set by PEIconHasDebugger. Essentially, PEIconHasDebugger is a function in the kernel that returns whether the device is debug enabled. This function is patched in most jailbreaks in order to return one or true. This is so that the sandbox and other things will not get in the way when you're running unsigned code. Now on a tethered boot, because iBoot is patched in order to make that value one, you will see that address bit in the com page set to one. Now on an untethered boot, because you're booting with a standard old boot chain, which is signed and not modified, that bit will be zero. And of course, based on what I've said, if you want to make my XNUF work compatible with iOS 5 and iOS 6 binaries, it's just a matter of editing a few files. Next slide. So low-level iPhone software isn't really that pre um, prevalent. I made something called iOS KXEC tools, and of course, there are also boot ROM exploits out there on older devices, and they provide developers with a way to directly mess with the hardware in the actual platform. So the, the, the things that you can do with this include running your own firmware, like you can port UEFI for ARM to an iPhone. You can also run your own operating system like Linux or FreeBSD 
or you can also run my own Darwin kernel or whatever, or you can also run a patched version of iOS that ignores signature checking, which is known as tether booting, which is honestly kind of boring as compared to the other options. Next slide. So there are many resources for low-level iPhone bring up that I like try to help um, build up, and also for kernel development. Um, I've open sourced a lot of my work so that you can see what it takes to like port Darwin to another architecture. You can also see um, <laughs> how the architecture port of XNU on ARM is designed. For example, like you can look at the structures in my XNU and then you can look at the actual XNU kernel and see the similarities to the design and you can also see some slight differences because I wanted to take some creative aspects. Like for example, here, um, iOS uses the fast interrupt timer and my kernel uses the regular interrupt timer. iOS uses a decrementer based design which is tickless and my kernel uses a tick based design. iOS uses a not really that modular platform expert. My kernel uses a modular platform expert. For compatibility purposes I use the same bootstruct as present with the normal kernel in order to maintain compatibility with iBoot and my bootloader. In fact my bootloader can actually load an Apple kernel if you provide it with the right type of device tree. I made an emulator, which made, basically was a very barren simulation of the Apple A5, and I was able to boot a stock kernel in order, and I was able, I was able to boot a stock kernel up till I okayed in it. Obviously it panicked, but the, considering the fact that it actually booted with my bootloader, which was bootstrapped from uBoot, a Linux-based bootloader, it's pretty awesome. Uh, next slide. So some links which contains some general resources. Um, there's always the chronic dev um, iBoot payloads, which are useful like, if you want to start researching into how iBoot works. There's also the iDroid project, which was porting Android to the iPhone 4, um, iPhone 3GS, iPhone 3G, and so on. Open iBoot serves as a very powerful um, documentation resource if you want to see how the hardware works. And obviously there is my own GitHub profile where a lot of my open source work is located, like Generic Booter, which is the bootloader for Darwin on ARM, the Darwin on ARM kernel, which got moved into the Darwin on ARM main project, Device Tree Compiler, um, TZ Boot, an example trust zone based bootloader for um, Apple A4, or other Cortex A8 based chips. And um, another wonderful resource is actually the DOS project by D. Howitt, because actually um, there is a sub project in Darwin on ARM called Kex Make Files. Kex make files allows you to compile kernel extensions for iOS using the DOS project. So it's utilizing the power of DOS and the power of the iPhone SDK and so on so that you can actually compile kernel extensions. Now you won't be able to use those kernel extensions on a stock iOS but if you can, uh, you can use it on my kernel and my clone of iOS because my kernel supports KXLD, you'll be able to link in your own texts and so on and well Next one is github.com. Well, obviously because there's a lot of other code out there that I'm not really aware of. And there's opensource.apple.com, which is a wonderful resource if you want to get like deep into the um, part of Mac OS X. Now, lately I've noticed that open source releases on opensource.apple.com seem to be rather shoddy, so um, there's still no open source code for XNU um, from Mac OS X, 10.9.1, 10.9.2. There's still no open source code for whatever's in Xcode 5. There's still no open source code for whatever's in um, iPhone OS 7, iPhone OS 7.1, and all those sub revisions. I just wonder where all of that code went. And of course, there's also the FreeBSD SVN, which is also a powerful resource because XNU and FreeBSD share a lot of the same design architecture as they were both based on the BSD kernel. Um, the mock kernel was originally based on the BSD kernel, but provides an entirely different memory management subsystem, um, which you one might consider to be incredibly dated as compared to the BSD subsystem. I have no real personal opinion on that, but um, BSD uses, oh, Mexner uses the mock VM subsystem, BSD uses UVM, but the general design of PMAP and other components, basically the same. So I want to show you some interesting pictures. So if you look at the next slide, you can see IBSS for K93AP. And the fun fact is if you look at the BDID, it's 08. That's an iPhone 4S running the iPad 2 
IBSS, and it just works, except for the display. The next slide contains IBEC for N94 AP running on an iPad 2. Um, these both are powered by K-Loader, which allows you to execute arbitrary ARM images on all sorts of Apple devices. The next slide contains a picture of U-Boot um, dumping memory from um, Xerix 34000, which is the SRAM base where LLB and IBS is loaded. You can also see the version and the board information. Um, the next slide shows an iPhone 4S being booted in verbose and with kprintf enabled. And the next slide features Linux booting from on the A5 from U-Boot again. Um, I didn't implement a full interrupt controller driver, so Linux panics very early in its platform initialization, but it won't be too bad. And then the next slide features EFI booting on the A5, um, which is bootstrap from either U-Boot or um, iBoot. And finally, the final slide features EFI on an iPad 2 running the Windows RT bootloader. So all I can say on the next slide is K-Loader is cool. It provides you with opportunities in which you can bootstrap your own code at a low level. It provides you with a way to run your own bootloaders, run your own boot chain. And it also allows developers to poke with the hardware at a level um, that's never been seen before. In fact, K-Loader is actually compatible in concept with every device from the iPhone 2G all the way up to the iPhone 5S, thanks to the design architecture present in all iPhones. Um, one of the bugs, well, one of the things I like to mess with is just general design architecture. Like, if you look at the port of XNU that is used in every iPhone, you can actually see some broken design bits. Like, I've noticed in Evasion, they look for the kernel PMAP, um, TTE base, through scanning for the struct in memory and then looking for the base address. Uh, the thing is, the kernel PMAP uh, TTE base is always actually allocated at a very static address. It's located 16 kilobytes after the top of kernel data. Um, and you can always just modify it from there if you know the kernel virtual base address. Um, this sort of design architecture flaw can't really be easily fixed and is just present over different iOS versions, which makes these types of bugs really, really powerful. Now, if anyone has any questions, just uh, let me know in the last four minutes that I have here. Uh, you've been going for 13 minutes. Yeah, last two minutes I have here. All right, well, round of applause, I guess. That works. Hey, I'm Britta, I, so you can hear me. I have a question. So when you say you'd like contributions to your projects, like what kinds of contributions would you appreciate? I would really recommend um, like different rewrites of different components so that people can learn how the general design architecture works. Like for example, in my XNU project, I've tried really hard to make the design architecture a lot like iOS, but also significantly different at the same time. Like the kernel PMAP design still uses the same architecture that Apple has with the kernel static mapping. But the way I implement PMAP is very much like the x86 version, which uses hash tables for data storage instead of storing it like um, right above the entries in memory. I think that was too technical. No. <laughs> How'd you pull off the tri-boot of iOS 5, iOS 6, and iOS 7 on an iPad? Repeat the question, please. How did you get the triple boot on the iPad? I think the iPad 2 specifically as well. Um, the iPad 2. Basically, I had a version of K-Loader, which were designed for iOS 5. And I used that instead of um, K-Loader on iOS 5 devices. iOS, instead of K-Loader on iOS 5 devices. Um, uh, K-Loader is actually designed for iOS 6 and iOS 7. It uses Planet Being's Patch Finder to dynamically find the kernel PMAP. And then modify translation table entries as to remap memory in real time. Copy the image into memory and then execute it. <laughs>
you want me to provide an English answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, he made like uh, around like six different partitions because iOS works on the basis of a system and a data partition for the user. So you'd have a basically it'd be system data, system data, system data, and that'd be for three different uh, iOS versions. And then you, it's just a matter of getting a bootloader to boot to the right partition. Yeah, as you can tell, I can't really give talks in English. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Hi, WinOCM, this is Dee Howitt. I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing. I'm floored. Thank you. This is Neato TV. Show off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Oh, yeah, why is First person who gets K Loader working on an iPhone 5S gets a cookie. <laughs> How did you learn how to um, develop at the operating system level and at such a low level? What was that? How did you learn to develop at such a low level, like on the operating system? Level? Uh, I started hacking Sonic ROMs like 10 years ago. <laughs> and then I was always interested in low level software. Um, like I was interested in the PS3 stuff. I was interested in general security design and systems architecture. Oh, we have another question. Okay, so um, just between us, just me and you and a hundred people in the room, what's your role going to be in Apple? What are you going to do for Apple if you, uh, just, you know, between us two and a hundred people? No comment. <laughs> I think that was no comment. <laughs> that was no comment. And any more questions, guys? No comment, no comment, no comment. Pod2G has a question. Hey, what's up? <laughs> um, just want to ask, uh, why don't you release uh, this jailbreak? I mean, I heard that you have a jailbreak. Um, you and I hate snow. I heard some... I, I, I've, I've, I've seen some tweets about that. So if it's not complete uh, I mean, you have a jailbreak. <laughs> All right. I could barely hear what you're saying. All right, so. don't, no, don't worry, I'll reply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the iBoot exploit that I have is basically reliant on okay. a key feature within iBoot only. And in order to get to that key feature, the device has to be already jailbroken, as Musclenor gave away. Um, so because of that, um, all that really you have to do is pull in the boot chain once, and then afterwards you can just bootstrap your own RAM disk. If you really don't even want to go through that much effort to make another payload for the next boot chain, you can just preserve the NAND flash, uh, the NOR flash, and then you can just use the same payload and then bootstrap to the 7.1 iBoot. And make sure that you fix some device tree things also, because like, I think the 7.0 device tree, Musner pointed that out to me, the 7.0 device tree won't boot on a 7.1 kernel. But yeah, it's just really a matter of uh, updating the file system and then bootstrapping into the 7.1 iBoot. There is no release, though. K-Loader is about as good as it gets for right now. So it's, it's only a matter of time. Okay. Well, low-level development. Okay. Cool, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Okay, well then, um, thank you, WinOCM. <laughs>